Welcome to this Euractive Policy Dialogue. Can glyphosate play a role in achieving greater biodiversity? I'm Brian McGuire. I'll be with you for the rest of this session. Our event today is supported by the Glyphosate Renewal Group. You can follow the debate at hashtag EA Debate. So please tweet your comments using the hashtag. Our social media team uh, will respond uh, to you there. And to ask questions, go to the chat section and uh, use the Ask button as well. Now, the question of how to achieve sustainable agriculture and a balanced relationship between the environment, farmers and consumers is more and more pressing. Biodiversity is one key player closely linked to and influenced by this relationship, as well as agricultural practices and production. Technological solutions are needed to ensure sustainable agriculture can contribute to greater biodiversity. And one of these solutions is glyphosate, a herbicide used for weed control in the European Union. The European Commission granted a five-year approval for glyphosate in 2017 and is currently approved for use until December 2022. Recently, the competent national authorities of four member states, France, the Netherlands, Sweden and Hungary, uh, created the assessment group of glyphosate and they concluded a draft scientific report on the assessment of the renewal. And the European Food Safety Authority and European Chemical Agency uh, open public consultations on the 24th of September, which will run for 60 days. And we'll discuss how biodiversity has uh, addressed in the scientific report on the assessment of the renewal. I will discuss glyphosate's role in agricultural practices and whether and how it can contribute to greater biodiversity. Joining us today to discuss this, uh, Dr. Jana Epperlin. She's a soil scientist and agricultural engineer at the Society of Conservation Tillage. Uh, Dr. Epperlin also works in the European Conservation Agriculture Federation Board. The ECAF represents the European network, which has for many years uh, great relations with the farmers' organizations worldwide, and it organizes the World Congress for Conservation Agriculture together with the FAO. We also have Dr. Simon Jeffrey, a reader in soil ecology at Harper Adams uh, University, and Dr. Virginie uh, Ducro, she is the environmental safety at Bayer, a GRG member. We'll also have a video uh, from uh, Sarah Singla, a French farmer that uh, grows wheat at Tricolet for seed, rape, alfalfa, winter peas, and many uh, cover crops on a family farm in the south of France. Sarah's a Nuffield scholar and a member of the Global Farmer Network. We'll uh, see a video with uh, Sarah uh, just after we hear from our excellent panel. Yana, you want to kick off with your introductory remarks? Okay. Thank you very much, Brian, for the introduction and greetings to all and the audience from Germany. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in this round table today and to represent a little bit of farmer's point of view. The soil, the one meter of sensitive skin of the earth, sustains all form of life in the terrestrial ecosystem and it's vital to the very existence and subsistence of human life. Soil quality is often measured in terms of yield. However, it is also related to soil structure, fertility, the activity of soil organisms, and the overall delivery of soil mediated ecosystem services. The concerns with agricultural sustainability have become more prominent in recent years as a result of several challenges imposed by the rise in the costs of food and energy, climate change, water scarcity, degradation of ecosystem services and biodiversity. With the focus on food security for a growing global population, there's a need to develop innovative cropping systems that are both uh, economically and iron, iron, environmental sustainable. Managing soil sustainability, maintaining their functionality in terms of their capacity of deliver the manifold soil mediated ecosystem services is the first step into long term soil quality and productivity. This means using nature-based solutions for crop production, such as conservation agriculture, which minimize soil disturbance, manage we manages weed and disease-based crop rotation and diverse, uh, diversity, and maintains the soil permanently covered. Thank you, Anna. Simon, over to you. Thanks, Brian, for that introduction, and hello, everybody from sunny Shropshire here in England. 
So yeah, um, I, I work a lot with soil and it's a fascinating area to work in. Uh, it's often not appreciated that there's actually more biodiversity below ground in one hectare of European soils than there is above ground in a tropical rainforest. And if we can look after that remarkable diversity and abundance of life, we can make it work for us. And that's important because soil is one of the most precious resources on the planet. More than 99% of the calories that are consumed each day come from soil that has either food that has come from either the soil directly in the form of plants or indirectly in the form of meat from animals that's been grazed, grazed on plants. Now, despite this literally vital importance, soils are often overlooked and underappreciated. And this lack of appreciation and care for soils means that now globally, 75% of, so of soils are classed as substantially degraded. And this causes crop yield projections to be reduced by an average of 10% globally and by as much as 50% in some areas by 2050. Now, a key means of improving soil health is the move towards conservation agriculture, which includes minimal soil disturbance through no-till and the direct drilling of seeds. And this is important because the life in the soil generally forms stratified layers. Some life is specialist at living on the soil surface, some moves between the surface and below ground environment, and some is specialist for living below ground. And when we invert that soil through tillage, we destroy the habitat for this life. Now, by working with our soils and working to protect our soils, we actually have the potential to mitigate numerous environmental and societal challenges from climate change to flooding and food security. And glyphosate represents a key tool in the toolbox of conservation agriculture, which allows us to address some of these issues. Thank you. Simon, thank you. Excellent. Evergeny, over to you. Hello, thank you, Brian. I'm very happy to be uh, in this uh, round and contribute uh, today. Um, I, I feel the public has many questions on the potential risks of glyphosate for the environment, for the soil and the soil health, which is really important for agriculture and also for biodiversity. So in order to make sure that these risks are evaluated correctly and using the most recent scientific data, Information on glyphosate safety has been collected by a group of seven companies. Uh, we call ourselves the Glyphosate uh, Renewal Group, which I represent today. And this uh, scientific information has been shared with the European authorities. So as you mentioned, Brian, this information is currently being evaluated by European safety authorities. And so far, we have the results of the assessment of this scientific information by four member states. And this first evaluation shows that the glyphosate meets the safety criteria as laid down in the European registration. So this first evaluation confirms that glyphosate is safe and it's also an efficient herbicide. The evaluation by other authorities uh, like EFSA or ECA, as you mentioned, is still ongoing. And one of the focus of this evaluation will be the effects uh, of glyphosate on biodiversity. We acknowledge in the GRG that biodiversity is a very complex topic. It requires in-depth discussion of the scientific and societal aspects. And uh, this is why I'm very happy uh, to be here today. And I hope we will have a very good conversation with the audience about the topics of soil health and biodiversity. Thank you. Virginie, thank you so much. And yes, uh, send in your questions. Uh, you don't have to wait until the special Q&A section. We're going to incorporate questions throughout the discussion today. Uh, if there's somebody you want to hear from in particular, please mention that. And also, if you can, let us know uh, who you are and where you're from. Uh, it would be great uh, to uh, show the kind of audience we have uh, there today. There are a lot of people registered uh, for this event. So uh, let's uh, send, hear from questions. In the meantime, uh, we're going to see the video from Sarah Singlas, the French farmer, you mentioned earlier. Hello, so I'm very pleased to be with you today. So my name is Sarah Singla. I am a French farmer. I live in the south of France. And on my farm, the particularity is that we are in no-till since 1980, which means that we haven't plowed and tilled the soil for 40 years now. So I'm very pleased to be with you today just to explain what I'm doing on the farm and to talk about agriculture. So to me, when it comes to agriculture, first of all, we need to think about food security, which means that we need to produce food and to intensify the productivity. Just because we have less and less land, we have a lot of desertification 
And we also see that the, the world population is increasing. Then when it comes to agriculture, we also need to look at the climate change because when we are farmers, we are the first one to, to, to be threatened by these changes. Uh, either we can get floods or we can also get a big uh, drought during the summer. So it means we are the first one to be concerned by the climate change. Then what we also want in our farming system is to show that we can maintain and protect biodiversity while we are producing food. We also want to have clean water, even if we use a herbicide and so on on our farm. And we want profitable farms because to be a farmer is a job and we need also to, to make profit on the farms. So by doing that, what I want to show you today is that we can produce and protect. Uh, until now, we have often seen people who, who said, either we produce or we protect. No, I want to show you that we can do both now. And the first thing we need to protect is the soil, because the soil is at the basis of every civilization. The soil is at the basis of agriculture, of farming. And the question today, is about how do I protect the soil regarding the herbicide I can use. So I will show you two herbicides. On the left side, you have a plow. On the right side, the herbicide used was glyphosate, which was spread on this cover crop before seeding the cash crop. And when I look at these two purpose and these two um, images, what I want to show you is that we, we have to address the biodiversity, we have to address the clean water and the climate change. The fact on the right side you, are, you have living plants means, means that you will store a lot of carbon for the photosynthesis. The fact I have flowers on this side means, means that we, I will have a lot of biodiversity. Personally, I work with two beekeepers on the farm because they know that there will be plenty of food for the, for the bees in summer. And if I address the water problem, there is a test called the slake test. So you, you will put in a bottle two samples of soil. This is a soil which was tilled or plowed. And this is a soil where I had spread a little bit of glyphosate. The problem when I touch the soil with a mechanic tool, such as the, the plow or even in mint till, is that in this case, I will destroy the soil microbiological activity. And when you destroy the soil microbiological activity, then everything collapses. And what I see is that the soil goes into the water and then I have a lot of floods. Whereas in this case, you don't destroy the soil biological activity and the soil stays in the water without anything. So it means that in this case, I have clean water, even if I have used a little bit of glyphosate. So the question today is, what do we want to do for the next generation? Do I want to see the soil going away or do I want to keep the soil in my fields and to have clean water for the population? Because we know that when we have floods, such as these pictures, it costs a lot of money to the population in order to get rid of all of this soil of the water. We don't want that. And the picture you see here are not natural. It's not because we have too much rainfall. It's just that we had some tillage around. And because of that, all the soil went away. What, what I want also to tell you is about climate change. On the left side, the herbicide I had used was uh, which I used here was mintil or tillage. So here you will lose four millimeters of water per day, which equals 28 millimeters per week. When you are in conservation agriculture, if you use a little bit of glyphosate, you will lose only 0.6 millimeters per day, which means it will be only 4.2 millimeters per week. And what we know is that we need, in every case, 25 millimeters to do one ton of dry matter, which means that on the left side, I have spent money, I have spent fossil fuel, I have spent a lot of time to destroy the soil 
and to make the water to be evaporated in, in the air. And I need this water to produce some dry matter. So the, the real question is today is not glyphosate or not glyphosate. It's what kind of agriculture do we want for tomorrow? What kind of agriculture do we want for the next generation? And when it comes to biodiversity, if I tell you about my farm, so this is my farm. As you can see, I work with a beekeeper. I have more than 60 hives on the farms. I see a lot of birds, a lot of pheasants, a lot of deers, and so on, even if I've been using this chemical product for a long time. And what I see on the farm is that my yields are increasing every year, despite the fact I... Uh, I, I use this herbicide and I am a happy farmer. That, that's uh, very profitable. And I think it's the best thing to do for the next generation. Thank you for your attention. Our thanks to Sarah, that was excellent. Uh, for a soil novice, that was very instructive. And I, two things uh, strike me. One is, first of all, uh, some, you said Simon, about 99% of uh, our calories uh, coming from the soil. Now, in truth, we should, most of us should be eating fewer calories. I will confess to that. And maybe that would help a little. But the idea that uh, so our whole existence is dependent currently um, on the soil, and yet we seem to neglect it to such a huge extent. And uh, Yana, uh, you mentioned about structure and fertility as well. And the structure element as well, I, I'll be fairly sure most politicians really don't associate that with flooding and uh, with climate change in, in terms of consumption of um, uh, fossil fuels to, to uh, till the soil, for example. So we're gonna, we have a huge range of, of dynamics at play here. I wanna try and tease those out during uh, the conversation. Let's talk, uh, first of all, about soil structure, which uh, each of you have touched on in different, different ways. Uh, yeah, soil structure, what Sarah said about flooding, you know, in, in Belgium, Germany, uh, during this year, there were heavy, heavy rainfalls. But um, is, are we sure that this soil uh, structure, because of tillage, is a contributing factor to, to flooding? Is this, is this something that should really be on the political radar? I know we're talking about glyphosate today, but uh, there's a different dimension to this as well. So uh, soil structure, how, how should we be addressing this? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's um, a very important that we talk today at first about the soil and some uh, yes important points what is related um, in the soil when maybe how Sarah is uh, mentioned is that when we till the soil and um, the soil structure is um, you can destroy uh, soil structure with tillage and um, what we use in our um innovative uh, and sustainable uh, um, con uh, conservation agriculture system that is we build a soil structure with roots and with the help of um, all the biodiversity in the soil so i think also um, uh, the soil structure is very important um, uh, also to to create a environment for the plants and for all the animals inside and also the roots help that uh, you can use all the fertile um, uh, uh, soil um, maybe from zero to 30 centimeters uh, and also for for the water infiltration it's very important that you don't with tillage you can create some um yeah some zones there roots don't can move uh, into the soil and in deeper soils and that also important that uh, in this structure the water can infiltrate in deeper zones Simon, we talk about the biodiversity of the soil. Why is it so important uh, that that's maintained? Uh, you, it, it would seem obvious uh, that you need to have certain level of nutrients and, and, and different things going on there. But you know, why is this so important? Why should we, it be left largely untouched? Uh, so it's, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, soil structure is a, a very um, uh, provides good insights into why this is important. So with that sleeking test that you saw with the soil that's falling down through the um, the filter 
in the tilled soil compared to the soil which remains whole in the untilled soil? Well, that is all due to fungal hyphae, which are binding soil particles together, and exudates, uh, compounds which have been exuded by the microbes, such as glomalin, which also help to stick the soil together. And these organisms, and many of these fungi are long filamentous uh, organisms, and when you plough the soil and break up the soil, uh, it breaks up those um, mycorrhizal fungi. So the problem there is that they, once they are killed, they're not producing these compounds, and so they break down over time and the soil structure can be lost. Now, as for why biodiversity is important, is the more organisms we can have doing these functions, the more resilient the systems are. If you then have a stress whereby, for example, there's a large flooding event and soils are flooded for a little while on top, uh, if you've got enough life there, even if some of that life is knocked back, more life remains which can carry on those functions, so you don't lose functions from the soils. There's a whole concept called functional redundancy, which is linked with biodiversity. Biodiversity is one of the main factors for that. Excellent. Who knew? <laughs> so, uh, the complexity of this for the, the average politician, I imagine, is just uh, not fathom. Um, we're getting, just, I want to turn just for a moment to uh, the risk element of, of glyphosate as well, and we'll bind some of this together. So, you know, from what my understanding, a report uh, my colleague uh, Geraldo Fortuna I wrote for Euractiv, the UN's Food Agriculture Organization, WHO, uh, and others, uh, European Food Safety Authority, European Chemicals Agency, and uh, they've all approved uh, glyphosate. They, they don't. Uh, they don't see any uh, uh, probability of carcinogenic uh, risk uh, from glyphosate. That's conflicting with uh, one agency that I can see, which is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, um, which says it's probably carcinogenic uh, to humans. Now, if it's probably carcinogenic from one agency, and we have the others, including WHO, saying it's probably not, and we have all these other risk factors as well, you sh is is this a no brainer? Are we are we worrying about something which we shouldn't be, given that there's a huge uh, cost to our, our ecosystem if we neglect uh, to take care of our soil uh, through these other directions? Yes, thanks, Brian. Now, I, I think it's uh, it's a very good and fair question to be aware as a society of the risks of pesticides in general. And it's only natural that people want to know what are the risks for the environment and for the human health of using glyphosate. And this is why uh, glyphosate has been marketed uh, for 40 years about right now. So uh, over these years, we have done a lot of scientific studies and also researchers in academia have done really, really plenty of, of studies. So we have a lot of scientific data. Also, since the last re-evaluation you were talking about, where the uh, authorities have concluded glyphosate is safe, we continued, and the scientific community in academia continued to do studies to investigate new aspects that were not covered in the evaluation before. So, for uh, just for the environmental safety part, we have about uh, 275 studies on about 50 different uh, species, white species. I'm not talking about the human toxicology part. And this uh, information has been and is at the moment, again, thoroughly reviewed by the authorities so that they can come up uh, with their own opinion, their own risk assessment based on the most recent scientific uh, scientific data. And uh, this information, those studies which we present and uh, the public literature and uh, the work uh, that is shown to the, to the authorities, this is all available uh, and this is transparently available to anybody in the public in uh, the GRG uh, website, which we can put uh, the link to uh, in the chat. So if you are curious about the studies, please go and see for yourself there. And I, I would like to re-emphasize that uh, at the moment, uh, the evaluation is ongoing in Europe. And the first draft report for the, for the four member states shows that uh, there is no concern, uh, there is no risk of using glyphosate, neither for the human nor for the environment.
So okay. we, we are confident that uh, this yeah. is an efficient Just, just from a decision-making point of view, the, the burden of proof would seem fairly clear here. Tillage damages the biodiversity and glyphosate at very best, uh, uh, the opponents of glyphosate could say, well, it's, we don't know, it's inconsistent. Uh, Simon, uh, you, how, how strongly do, do you see this as uh, uh, tillage continuing as, as a problem uh, for our food supply in the future? Because you know, if, if the crop yield diminishes uh, so substantially as you outlined in some areas, even by 50%, you know, are we looking at food shortages if we don't change uh, farming methods globally? Uh, it's a great question. It is, it's very hard to make these predictions. For certainly the yield projections would suggest that we're heading in that direction and food security is under threat. Now, uh, conservation agriculture is just one tool to try and help mitigate this, but certainly moving towards at least minimum till, if not no till, uh, seems to be beneficial in terms of soil health, even though it doesn't move quite far enough in that direction. So the evidence would suggest, but again, one of the hard things about uh, predictions is it's very hard to predict that the future is, is, is difficult to tell, but that is what the model suggests at the moment. Uh, now, there are also uh, there's growing impetus to try and get more carbon into our soils. So if we can move back to mixed farming methods, uh, that may also help alleviate some of these issues. Uh, but then we're moving in a, a, the conversation away from the conversation about glyphosate. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, the, the, Sarah mentioned, and uh, she showed them one of the, the pictures, the difference uh, between the, the till soil and uh, that where she, she used cover crops. What's the difference between a cover crop and a cash crop? How does that work? Yes, um, cover crops we use in between the cash crops. So um, our first aim is don't uh, let the soil be unprotected. So we want over the whole season um, uh, living plants on the field. So that is very important. So um, also in the past, we have, uh, uh, we recommend to leave a lot of the residues also from the cash crops on the field. But uh, now we, we, know, uh, we know that it's also important that we have over the whole season, uh, living plants on 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 the soil and they feed uh, the animals inside the soil and they protect the soil um, um, against uh, erosion and for wind and water and um, yeah it's, it's it's very important that um, we have such uh, uh, we build such uh, systems uh, where we uh, put not only cover crops, all, uh, also we uh, use other systems like under seeding, but maybe for instance for for maize, uh, also for corn, that we use um, also that we protect the soil. Maybe when we have some uh, crops where we have a big space between the um, the plants and also we can use uh, accompanying pl uh, plants maybe in rape so we have different uh, tools inside to create a, a farming system where we have that's very important uh, all the time um, the soil covered that's in in uh, yeah in all thinking what we what we doing is to to have this uh, in mind Okay, thank you. Just to remind our audience to send in some questions. We'll turn to those in a few minutes. Uh, we're gonna, let's talk a little bit about the assessment group and the draft scientific report and the assessment of the renewal. You know, what are the key findings from this? What's, what's uh, worth noting? Yes, so um, the, I, I can uh, maybe re-emphasize again that the, the overall risk assessment for the environmental part when we are using glyphosate is showing that there is no concern that glyphosate is affecting the wildlife. So we have been looking at the birds, the mammals, the bees, 
the uh, insects, the terrestrial and the aquatic plants, fishes, crustaceans, microbes in the soil. In the soils, we have been looking at earthworm, different types of columbulans. We have been looking at the structure, so how many species we find, and the function. So are the earthworms, the columbulan, the microorganism community functioning well so that they can uh, participate to transform to the nitrogen and can they uh, help gather the soil structure as was mentioned earlier by Yana and Simon. So we have been looking at this very thoroughly and, and we found no adverse effects on glyphosate on this. One uh, key topic which is new in this evaluation to answer your question, what is special about this evaluation is that we also looked at the effects of glyphosate on biodiversity more broadly. So we looked both at the effects that glyphosate may have directly on the survival, on the growth, on the development, on the reproduction of the wildlife, which is quite a standard approach for European risk assessment and also this is done like this also worldwide. But what is new in this uh, dossier is that we looked also at the indirect effects of glyphosate. Uh, and with this, I'm thinking about uh, when you use a herbicide, the consequence of using this herbicide will be that you are removing the weeds in your cropped field. And with this, uh, you are also uh, removing potentially some food and some habitat space for the wild species. This is not specific to glyphosate. You would end up with the same results uh, with any weed control method that you would use. For example, if you are using a plow, you would be in the same situation. But for the first time, we are trying to evaluate, do we have indirect effects on biodiversity through this cascading uh, food, uh, food chain? And this is okay. just a new it, feature. It, is, is the assessment just looking at risk factors or is it also looking at benefits, potential benefits? So, in the European uh, regulations, when we register pesticides, there is no part of the dossier where we discuss the benefits. So we discuss the efficacy of the molecule and we discuss also the risks for the human and for the environment. So in, in, the, in the dossier, as recommended by the law, there is no part where we discuss the benefits. Uh, in this submission, we have added uh, some documentation for information purpose that is also available for everybody on what are the benefits of using glyphosate in agriculture and then it go back to uh, what uh, Saha has explained before that this is a great tool for conservation tillage so you can add it in your uh, uh, crop management system to uh, enable low till or no till which will help preserve the soil and will help preserve the water, which are really important resources for the farmers. Thank you. Uh, Simon, you know, the cost benefit side of this as well, it, you know, it seems to me a little odd that the risk analysis should neglect uh, potential benefits, at least as, as a significant uh, afterword as well. You know, the, the idea that uh, there could be some substantial benefits from this, and at least there's a do no harm approach uh, at very worst, uh, given, given the evidence. Uh, so, you know, is there should the modeling here for political discussion be more sensitized to the benefits rather than simply looking at risk analysis and all the headlines that that can generate, correctly or incorrectly? Uh, well, I think it is important to have a balanced approach, not necessarily within the work that Virginia is doing because they have a, a specific task, of course. But when data is presented on on this, it, it should obviously be presented in a balanced way, and undoubtedly there are. There is evidence out there that it can be beneficial. Uh, classic example, there was a meta-analysis published about three years ago, uh, looked at over 100 studies, and what they showed was that with tillage, you can destroy your earthworm populations, which is, again, perhaps not surprising. They're soft-bodied organisms. If you mash up their house and cut up the organisms, then they die. With glyphosate, there was no visible impact on earthworm communities at all. 
So why is this important? Well, another meta-analysis has shown that all else being equal, if you've got earthworms in your soil, you can expect 25% greater yields than if you don't have earthworms in your soil. So if you put those two things together and see the power that uh, no-till can have in terms of maintaining the soil community in a healthy way, and then the work that that can do for us to support the sustainability of agriculture, well, glyphosate plays a, a key role in that. Now, that is obviously outside of work done on ecotoxicology and the like, but it should certainly be reported alongside it. Excellent. Clearly, earthworms need to speak up a bit more and give them their, their huge uh, benefit uh, to, to the yield. Uh, we have some comments here. Let's uh, take a quick scan through them and some questions. See what we're doing. So uh, Martin from Pan Europe says, no-till agriculture is a means to increase soil fertility, biodiversity, carbon content, but you failed to mention that no-till is possible without glyphosate. Real uh, agroecology uses cover crops and crop rotation is an efficient alternative to glypho and its toxicity on soil organisms. Thank you, Martin. And uh, Christian Cather is the link to the website there, glyphosate.eu for the renewal group. Thank you, uh, Christian. And uh, Hans van Scheren as well, uh, Corporate Europe EU study. Their study published this summer shows that many industry studies and glyphosate have not made basic uh, OECD scientific standards. While perhaps that's the case, and uh, the balance of evidence that we outlined earlier as well, and refer to Geraldo's article, you can find it on the interactive website. And uh, so you balance that out. And uh, Martin from Pan again, I'll come back in a moment. Uh, Gottlieb Bash, and nobody questions. Uh, OF regarding productivity losses, but Sarah said very clearly yields are increasing. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment, actually. And uh, Gottlieb also, please compare the number of earthworms under no till and organic plowing. Then you can tell about soil toxicity of one to the other. I think Simon's just uh, touched on that as well. Okay, please keep sending in your questions, and uh, we want to hear uh, more from you on that. And okay, so I want to focus on. on uh, you know, the, the farmer's profitability. Um, Sarah said she's doing well, things are, are, are profitable. There's also a, a side to this where if the, the food production is not profitable, food is not produced. And so the idea that we should compel uh, farmers to uh, produce uh, a, a system which doesn't use glyphosate, but uh, reduces the biodiversity in the soil, weakens the soil structure, makes farming less profitable. That doesn't seem like a win-win on any scale, Jana. Do you, is, is, this, um, is the opposition to glyphosate just emphasized too much? Mm, can, you, can you repeat it? <laughs> can, sure. Just, yeah. we, you, Sarah, Sarah was saying that her her farm is doing well, and prof, farming is not a hobby; it's a business, and so it has to be profitable. Of course, if yeah. farmers are not, yeah. and of course, we subsidize farming substantially in Europe, but still, we we see farmers struggling uh, to 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 keep ahead. Uh, so, if food production um, is uh, not profitable, we don't have a strong enough food supply, and this doesn't just apply in Europe clearly as well, and yet. Food uh, farming could be more profitable, it seems, from uh, some of the things that Simon's outlined as well and from what Sarah said, uh, through through uh, different approaches, including use of glyphosate. So uh, is, is the discussion here focusing, um, should focus more on the food production, food security and food production as well? Um, yes, we must uh, focus on uh, food production. And when I look into our farmers' organization, so we, so it's also um, uh, a new system. So uh, a lot of our farmers work with conservation tillage, and um, it's also a system what it's need uh, a lot of uh, education and a lot of experience and a lot of um, adoption of uh, some aspects. So um, I think they must um, step uh, forward from uh, to reduce step by step the tillage and the operation, but also to look to the um, other so the crop rotation to to op, uh, input also cover crops in the system and so it's 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 also um, a way uh, where the farmers must uh, learn a lot um, 
and uh, to adopt the system and also what our uh, experience is in our former organization that when they use uh, conservation tillage up to also no-till and uh, in the first years of, of changing the tillage system um, it can be that the yields go a little bit down and um, but then it comes more and more stable in the soil and all the farmer can handle all um, inputs in the system. So I think it's a very profitable system uh, to how Sarah has also mentioned that um, they uh, earn money with uh, the system. And, and that's very important that uh, also the aspect to have more uh, education, more network, more, um, more knowledge about the system and um, all aspects inside this uh, conservation agriculture That's system. Point, Diana. So, yeah. let, me, let me ask you about that as well. You work, as you said, with a lot of farmers organizations uh, as well. So the education aspect of this as well, what's the state of play with farmer education? This do farmers uh, understand the cost benefits of the, the different approaches or is there still work to be done in explaining this? Uh, the cost benefits? Benefits of, of tillage versus glyphosate or alternatives? And Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of um, uh, results that uh, we the farmers save a lot of costs uh, when they use um, the herbicides or and uh, maybe you can, must change it when you can't use um, the herbicides you must um, have one two or maybe sometimes also three operation of tillage and that's a lot of cost uh, intensive in the system and um, I think the farmers looked uh, to the cost and when you see also how the prices for uh, maybe for fuel and for everything it's uh, rise up so I think for farmers it's very important that they um, have less costs in inside the farming system and I would understand that the organizations themselves farmers organizations and large producers would have this kind of knowledge but for smaller producers as well is the, the I'm, I, I can't answer this so I'm asking you is, is it are smaller farmers in particular are they um, do they have this kind of knowledge the working knowledge of uh, you, the different percentages of yield versus different types of uh, tillage and, and herbicide use and the, the, also the side, side effects the, the negative effects uh, of tillage for example and how uh, soil uh, erosion and, and um, biodiversity destruction is is uh, an outcome of some of those activities as well. Is that kind of knowledge? Is it common knowledge in the farming community, or is these or are these uh, is this a level which really only happens at organisations and, and large and large businesses? No, I, I I think I so what we notice is that over the last decades, the farmers' awareness of the soil and all also this uh, tillage system or, or, or no-till system uh, change a lot and um, they what we see we they want to become more um, or become more information about uh, this uh, environmentally friendly and soil protecting system so um, when you also see that uh, maybe since one or two days we have um, a new um, YouTube channel, maybe it's also in, um, an example uh, now around the COP26 that uh, it's called Farmer Speaking Up. So they, they want also to, to uh, talk about his experience in, in the site to um, uh, save uh, or to protect the soil and to uh, create new uh, systems for farming. Okay, thank you. Simon, you wanted to come back in on uh, till uh, being done without the use of glyphosate. 
Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, so, yeah, it is indeed true. I've come across some uh, farmers that I've spoken with who have been trying to do conservation agriculture and no-till and haven't been using glyphosate as part of their rotation. And what they've generally been doing is when they've been growing cover crops in order to kill the cover crops, uh, they've been using something called a crimp roller. So that involves going rolling over the cover crops and basically trying to bend, bend all of the stems of the cover crop and, and getting a, a kill of the cover crop that way. Now, one of the problems with that is uh, generally farmers would wait until there were two or three heavy frosts in order to make the stems as brittle as possible to be able to maximize the kill of the cover crop to prevent it growing back up through through the cash crop. And obviously with climate change, we're already experiencing fewer harsh frosts than we were and moving forward, that's likely to get even worse. On top of that, a big issue is perennial grass weeds. Outside of tillage and glyphosate, there's not really any way of controlling those. So if you are running a no-till system and you have an issue with, uh, with perennial grass weeds, then glyphosate really is your only solution without resorting to tillage. Okay, let's follow up on a question uh, from Alaric. From that, maybe uh, give me what uh, follow up from Simon. Uh, Alaric uh, Sandrup uh, from Sweden. Have you studied the possible impact on the biodiversity from the herbicides that would replace glyphosate? And there are two alternatives to glyphosate, more mechanical weeding or other herbicides. Most of them are worse for the environment than glyphosate. Simon, what, what are the alternatives to glyphosate in terms of herbicides? Uh, that's not really my area of expertise, I'm afraid. Uh, so okay. I suspect one of the other speakers would be better off place with that. Okay. Anyone else? Forgive me. Have a go at that. Yes, I, I think I can have a go with this. So um, th there are a few alternatives uh, to glyphosate, but then the system would look uh, very different because glyphosate has the specificity that it is really targeting the plants. So its mechanism of action is aiming at killing the plants, but it, it's a broad spectrum mode of action. So it will work on many, many weeds. If you would now take another herbicide, there are other categories of herbicides that are much more specific. So they target some specific type of plants. So if you would uh, replace glyphosate, you would need maybe to use two or three different herbicides to come up to the same results that you want to control the weeds in the field. So there are possibilities but it may mean using, at the end of the day, more herbicides to do the job that glyphosate can, uh, can do alone. And for answering the question, yeah, I, I can maybe I answer you... quickly. Uh, no, go ahead, please go ahead. The question on did we assess the impact uh, on biodiversity of other herbicides? So, um, I, I think the way we addressed it in the glyphosate evaluation is valid for uh, all kind of broad spectrum herbicides or all type of herbicides we have. We have not yet uh, officially uh, investigated the uh, effects of biodiversity on the many other herbicides just because this is the first time ever that we go for an herbicide in a European renewal process with a risk assessment on biodiversity. So we are doing this for the first time with glyphosate and we are going to apply the same rationale or the same approach to evaluate the effects of bio on biodiversity of other herbicides but also on other insecticides or fungicides in the future. So we have already started uh, to do this. And, and the I, I would guess, for it. Okay, I, I would guess that the process of assessing the interaction of multiple herbicides becomes even more complex and takes even more time. Would that be right? Compared to evaluating a single that risk assessment on one, uh, which in this case is glyphosate. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, please keep sending some questions and we'll, we'll come back uh, to those in, in just a moment uh, as well. Um, so we have the multiple, uh, there are some options clearly uh, to glyphosate as well. So uh, you, the, the, the process of evaluation, why has there been such concern that so much political energy is invested in assessing uh, glyphosate? Uh, Jana, why, 
why does it get to this level of, of agitation politically where there's such strong opposition? And yet, uh, from the evidence I see in front of me, um, that probably isn't merited. Yana. Yeah. Um, can I uh, at first uh, add something to to what uh, Virginie said to the yes, of alternatives uh, of glyphosate? So we have also um, uh, moderating an on-farm research project where we compare some alternatives from um, to the glyphosate use. So we have there some. Um, some very shallow operation of tillage and also so electrophysical operation and also a um, so-called biological um, yeah, uh, variant of uh, in this on-farm research where we have some uh, underseeing and some plants. But what we see is that uh, regarding also what we discussed before, the costs and also uh, they rising a lot and that also the impact in the soil, what we measured with earthworm and also with fungi, with some bacteria and so on. So that um, when we re want to replace it, uh, the glyphosate with maybe tillage or also with some electrophysical um, operations. So it's, um, it's not that what we want to protect our soil. So it's very, um, difficult to find um, also in the no, uh, in the no-till system some alternatives, some non-chemical alternatives uh, uh, to the glyphosate use. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a comment here from Martin uh, from Pan Europe, which intrigues me a little bit. Uh, Martin, if you want to add a little bit to this, but keep it short, uh, I'll take a look at it. The, he, Martin says the GRC, GRG is taking advantage of the weakness of the EU risk assessment process to claim it is safe. Non-industry studies point to glyphosate's general toxicity and soil toxicity. Why is no one talking about that in the panel? Uh, to be clear, we want to be balanced and we want to hear uh, all sides of the discussion. So, uh, Martin, if you want to add a little bit more to that, uh, we'll try and talk about that uh, with the panel as well and uh, put that up. But please keep your comments short. I'm not going to read out an essay. And uh, also others there as well, please send in your comments. And if you can, please direct them to who uh, you want uh, to answer that question as well. And we'll try and deal with that uh, for you as well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the political process here as well in terms of what happens next. So we've got the assessment uh, group and the draft scientific report and the assessment of the renewal. Uh, Virginia, what happens next? Where, where do we go uh, from here? Public commenting phase uh, that is ongoing where EFSA and ECA are collecting uh, the information from the public, from research institutions, so anybody really can uh, participate in this scientific discussion and comment to EFSA and ECA. So once this period of comment will be closed, EFSA and ECA will review the comments. They will extract the relevant questions or open questions on the risk assessment of glyphosate. And they will come back to this, to the, to the four member states who did the initial evaluation to find answers to these questions. And they may also come back to the GRG to ask for more data or for complementary uh, information. And once uh, EFSA and HECA will have received uh, the complementary information from us and from the member states, then they will uh, come up to their final conclusions and they will issue uh, a final assessment uh, and classification report, which will also be available uh, to the public. And once this is done, those documents, so the conclusion on the classification and on the risk assessment, will be uh, discussed at the European level with uh, the 27 uh, European member states. For a final decision, will we reauthorize the use of glyphosate as an active ingredient in Europe or not? So this, these are okay. the next steps of the process. So I just I'm, I assume that this will go to Parliament for a final vote after Council approves. Would, would that be right? Um, maybe you know, it, it, absolutely hundred percent. It, it goes to a, a, a special panel of uh, European. 
representative of the, the different member states, and this panel is called the, the score path. And, and they okay. are experts in uh, assessing uh, those questions, and they do that for every pesticides that are put on the market in Europe. So there is okay. a standard process for this in Europe. Thank you. Jana, do you want to add anything to that? No? Okay. Simon, you wanted to bring a comment again on toxicity. Go ahead. About the toxicity of glyphosate jets, well, well, certainly none of us are doubting the fact that it is a toxic compound. It is a phytotoxin. It's a herbicide. That is kind of the point of it. The question is much more to do with whether it's harmful to the environment. Now, there are certainly some studies out there which have shown that it can have negative impacts on aquatic life, such as the European eel. I've seen studies which look at uh, impacts on the respiratory morphophysiology of bullfrog tadpoles. One of the issues with many of these studies is that they are quite far removed from the real world situation. So in both of those studies, they expose organisms to a rate which is measured in milligrams per litre of glyphosate. Now, there's a meta-analysis that came out in 2017, which looked across four years of study, and the highest level which was achieved within the surface waters across France was 0.4 microliters, uh, micrograms per litre. So that's basically between 2,000 and 4,000 times less exposure uh, than uh, was used in these laboratory studies which did show toxicity to aquatic organisms. So one of the issues is we really need studies out there which show realistic exposure levels. And now science often has this issue where publication bias is a real problem. It's very difficult for scientists to publish studies where we don't find a significant finding and that kind of incentivizes people uh, to sometimes force a significant result in order to be able to get a publication from it. So there is some bad science around this. As I say, none of us are doubting that uh, glyphosate is a toxic compound. It is a phytotoxin, that is the point of it. Uh, but most of the evidence suggests it is much less harmful to all other organisms within the environment, uh, within the soil environment than tillage. Okay, thank you, that was clear. Um, okay, so I'm going to come back on the question of non-industry studies. See that was okay. Um, Martin, I think okay. Let's bring it back to our, our, our audience. So Martin says the regulatory studies are non-perfect and need a strong upgrade. Okay, therefore evaluators need to take into account non-industry studies. I don't think anybody would uh, argue with that. And uh, weirdly enough, many of the non-industry studies identify genotoxicity of glyphosate or toxicity on soil biodiversity, contrary to what's claimed uh, by this panel. Maybe. And these non-GRG studies are almost systematically disregarded uh, by regulators. Uh, is that fair, panel? Yes, maybe I can uh, start answering this if, if you like. So um, in uh, the last re-evaluation, so uh, over the period of five years, uh, we have been looking at all the new scientific literature that has been published, and this is more than 12,000 articles from independent research, so no, not produced by the GRG. So this is really a huge number of studies uh, we, we looked at, and, the, and we, we have really been uh, looking at what is available exhaustively. Then once we have gathered this uh, big package of study published by independent scientists, uh, we apply the rules from, uh, that, that apply in the European legislation to sort these this studies and to identify which studies are relevant for the risk assessment. Uh, this is also the way we do it and the results of this assessment is also transparently available. So if you go to the GRG website, you will find information on how we did it and what is the end result of this. And uh, all the relevant studies, they are submitted as part of the dossiers to the authorities. The authorities have also the opportunity to spot some studies which they think are relevant and come back to us and ask us to analyze the results of these studies. And they can also uh, do that by themselves. So we have several, let's say, 
would say safety mechanisms to ensure that the, the good science, the, the relevant studies that are useful in the risk assessment will be picked up in the dossier and will be evaluated and considered. It, it has happened also uh, for different compounds uh, that sometimes uh, a risk assessment or an endpoint is driven by a study from the literature and not by a study produced by the applicant. So uh, those, those studies, they are really considered very carefully according to the uh, EU requirements in the EU uh, registration. Website. Okay. Yeah, no, the, the, I've covered uh, glyphosate uh, some years ago in a lot of detail and anti-industry activists, to give a, an umbrella term, uh, would usually come with the perspective that this is all about the money, that uh, it, it doesn't matter what the science says, that, that ultimately uh, Big Pharma uh, wants to produce uh, chemicals, big chemical companies want to produce uh, for agriculture and just make money, and we'll all pay the price for this as well. Uh, you, 12,000... Uh, articles not produced by the GRG, an evaluation system which includes the World Health Organization, uh, the European uh, Commission, uh, member states, uh, and the European Food Safety Authority, European Chemical Agency as well. They can't all be in the pocket of industry. So you know, how, how does this discussion get to this level where so much bad press is given to glyphosate when uh, what we should be rightly calling expert opinion uh, is uh, is saying, look, we can't see any significant uh, issue here. Um, yes, um, I think uh, we must look like uh, Simon say in his introduction that we have uh, the glyphosate is one tool in in the toolbox from the farmer. So and they use also a lot of other tools inside this for fertilizer and equipment and so on. Um, so I think um, it's what we must uh, look is uh, how can we create a, a farming system was is sustainable for and was is uh, protect our soil and also produce healthy food and to to be a, for uh, a healthy humans so um, i think uh, the discussion is uh, become so sensitive because um, yeah the uh, press and uh, they publish a lot of um, that it's danger and so on so but um, i think what uh, Virginie said that it gives a lot of uh, uh, scientific papers and she says how many articles uh, was in this renewal process. So um, I think um, we must also look what it's necessary for. Uh, also what uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, what we want, um, which kind of agriculture we want uh, for the future and for the next generations. So. Um, I think so. We must look more in this di uh, direction. Thank you. Forgetty, after assuming this renewal is granted, will that be the end of the story is, or is it uh, up for renewal every five years? How is this going to work afterwards? Forgetty. Yeah, sorry, can you repeat your question? Sure. It, it's. Uh, it's uh, after uh, the renewal is granted, assuming it's a granted, is that the end of the story? Does the European Union settle and say, look, there's enough evidence now? Or is there a constant evaluation process that will continue? Yes. So um, it is a constant evaluation process that continues. So two things will happen. If, if the renewal is granted, then... Uh, we, it will be a re, an authorization for the active substance. Then every country in Europe will go through specific risk assessment of the glyphosate product and uh, will decide whether or not they want to authorize their products for their countries. So after the evaluation from you, there is another layer where we look at the products and this is done at the country level. And in parallel, 
uh, we continue to gather data. The scientists continue to uh, create science and answer scientific questions about glyphosate. And uh, there will be again another uh, evaluation by Europe uh, in a few years. So typically for uh, most of the pesticides, the scientific information is reviewed every 10 years. So every 10 years, the European Commission goes through this information and decides, do we uh, agree to reauthorize or not? For glyphosate, the last time it was shorter, it was only five years. And the reason for that is that there is in five years, as I said, already so many scientific so much in information that is produced that uh, waiting 10 years for the commission was something that didn't really make sense. So they say, okay, the science is so fast, let's look at it after five, five years. So this is why we had a five year evaluation uh, span for glyphosate, whether normally it's 10. But yeah, in general, every pesticides are reviewed completely every 10 years in Europe. Okay, thank you. It seems strange to me, though, that individual member states still have to make a pronunciation on this um, afterwards as well, in terms of just the single market functioning. If there are significant yields and advantages in different uh, different forms that we've discussed, um, that the single market would be disadvantaged um, uh, by that as well. Let's go back to some of the comments on the audience. And we have from Cornelia. Uh, please keep sending questions, and we still have some time. Uh, we, Cornelia says, I think we should look into quality, not a quantity of studies. Let's do both. Uh, Andy Pruer says, how much does the surfacant add to the toxicity of the, Simon, maybe you want to take this one, yeah? How much does the, let me just move my screen. How much does the surfacant add to the toxicity of applied formulations? Glyphosate is found in soil bacteria, unlike silicon and polyalkylator surfacants. Do you get the question? Uh yeah, I get the question. Uh, so surfactants are applied in order to allow glyphosate to get through the kind of waxy, waterproof coating of plants because you need to get the active product into the plant for it to be able to have an effect. So there are some plants, particularly hairy plants such as nettles, uh, which glyphosate can have difficulty getting into. Now, surfactants are made naturally within the environment and the uh, compound doesn't stick around for a very long period of time. This uh, comment that glyphosate has been found in soil bacteria Generally, it's actually AMPA, which is found in the soil bacteria, which is a breakdown product of glyphosate, and that's a non-toxic breakdown product. Uh, that's often used as a biomarker for uh, glyphosate mobility within the environment. How much surfactant adds to the toxicity? I've not seen any data to show that it makes it more harmful to the environment at all. It does make it more efficacious in terms of knocking back weeds, which actually means you, need, you can get away with applying less of it. Thank you. Brigini, uh, Jana, other if you want to add to that? Mm. No. No, I don't. No, I not much specific. Yeah. Okay, let's let's move on then. And uh, CR, whoever you are, says, uh, do you use the Klimish criteria uh, for evaluating science? It's uh, uh, Christina Rudin, Stockholm University. Sorry, Christina, didn't say that. Thing. And do you use the Klimish criteria for evaluating science? Simon Virginia. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this is. How we start the literature study. So the study from non-industry uh, published by, by the scientists in the academia. So yes, the, the Klimish score is one of the tools which we use uh, according to the regulation, the European regulation, to evaluate the relevance of the studies for the risk assessment. Beyond the Klimish scores, we are also uh, using some other uh, equivalent uh, metrics to to look at uh, to look if the studies are fit for the purpose of a, of a risk assessment, and and so, so these scores or other scores they are very standard uh, way to evaluate uh, if if a paper is fit for the purpose of uh, being used in a risk assessment. Thank you, uh, Agneta Sundgren. She says there is a consultancy process going on. Uh, from ECHA and EFSA for the moment. Isn't that the possibility for non-industry studies to be added if relevant, Jana? I guess it's slightly rhetorical like that as part as well though. It's uh, telling us that they 
put all things in this uh, discussion yet. So. Okay. Uh, Kirsty says, I fully agree with Virginie that all public available, publicly available data, including non-industry reports, this is included in the glyphosate dossier, all of which is available for transparency purposes. And uh, I'm sure corporate uh, EU would appreciate that. This public data is reviewed and anything relevant is included, including non-industry papers. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so please keep sending your, your questions there as well. Virginie, you know, is it, you know, for me, you, you work for, for, uh, for Bayer as well, and clearly there's, there's a lot in, invested in, in this. You know, is this a, you, is this a, a market-driven approach to science or a science-driven approach to the food market as well and food security? Yes, so I, I really like your question, um, Brian. I have not uh, always been uh, working for Bayer. So I started my career at university, and uh, then I have been working in France since the National Institute for Agronomic Research for, for a long time, for more than eight years. And I joined Bayer seven years ago. The reason that I joined Bayer was exactly what you mentioned, because this is a a research and development company. So uh, the company is doing its own research, trying to find out new uh, products or other tools. Fire is not only working on, on pesticides, but tools for agriculture that will help in the future to uh, become more sustainable so that we, we can better protect the soil, we can better protect the water uh, resources. Of course, a big part of what we do is marketing pesticides. And the reason why I joined Bayer was exactly that, because I knew this is the kind of R&D company where you can go in the company, you can participate into the research. So, for example, I have been working since four years on developing a new herbicides molecule to replace over the, the time, the older herbicide molecules. And I have really big hopes that uh, those new molecules will have a better environmental profile. And uh, th this, is, this is really something that I, is, is really close to my heart. So uh, my perception is that uh, Bayer, and there are also other industries in the GRG that have the same philosophy, that it's more a science-driven uh, willingness to advance tools for farmers and for sustainable agriculture than uh, a market-driven uh, uh, approach. Of course, this is a company and the company needs to make money, like every company, but uh, I, I've I think that uh, we, we are really living this philosophy of uh, being more sustainable for the future. We have a big responsibility there, for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christina responded uh, from Stockholm University. Uh, that was a clever layup, uh, Christina. Uh, she says, Klimish is very criticized and is an effective way to downgrade non-industry data. Uh, Virginie, do you agree with her? Is, this, uh, is it very criticized? Is it a clever way to uh, downgrade non-industry data? Um, this, this is what I was uh, also saying. So we are not only using the Klimish score. We are also, in parallel of Klimish, using different scales or scoring systems. Um, and we take care that all the scoring systems that we are using are uh, validated by the European uh, regulators. So th th there is really a clear guidance, if you will, how we are supposed to evaluate these studies. And Klimish score is one of the tools that is made available to us, but it's not the only one. So I hope that with combining the evaluation with several tools and not only Klimish, we can overcome the limitations that uh, are existing for this indicator. Okay, thank you. That's a fair answer. Uh, Andrew Pruer comes back. Maybe Simon, you want to have a go at this and see if Yana or Virginia want to add. Uh, how much uh, would carbon emissions from soil and tillage increase in the EU if glyphosate was banned? I have this, a question also. And conserving soil health and reducing climate change will have a larger impact on human health than reducing chemical usage on farming. It's all about the big picture, Simon, isn't it? 
Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, most of our soils around uh, Europe are quite depleted in carbon due to a, a history of extensive tillage. The, the issue with that is basically as you drag your cow through the soil, you break open these aggregates and you release soil organic matter that was previously protected, which uh, can then be broken down by microbes within the soil. So by stopping tillage, basically you allow more carbon to become protected in the soil. Now, the studies on how much more carbon we get into soils through conservation agriculture are actually quite variable. One of the issues is generally once you move towards conservation agriculture using glyphosate rather than using tillage, it takes some time for the biology to get going. It takes some, uh, a while for your earthworm populations to increase and it's those which bring the carbon down into the soil. So for example, there's a meta-analysis which shows that over the first five years after conversion, we don't actually get increased carbon within the soil because it's generally still sitting on the soil surface. Now, by applying soil ecological theory, we would expect that carbon to be taken down into the soil over time. As for how much more carbon we can store in soil once we stop tilling, well, many of our soils are about 2% or 3% down on soil organic matter compared to where they would be if they were in grassland. So many tons per hectare we could, we could uh, in theory, sequester. Now, it will take quite a long time to get that carbon into the soil. It's not something that can happen overnight, unfortunately. Okay, so back to our worms. Give worms a chance, people. Uh, anybody else want to add to that? Yana, for Guinea? Uh, yes, also, it's also, it's, it, yeah, it's also important to store carbon um, in the soil that uh, uh, you change the tillage or the system um, and make it for long term. So um, because it takes time um, also to to how um, how we heard two or three percent of carbon in the soil, it takes time. And um, yeah, that's that's important that we don't uh, create uh, such um, uh, tillage systems not only for one or two years so that we have uh, maybe more of the long term um, in our mind. Okay, thank you. And uh, have we got anything else to add there? Well, no, I, I think I, I also see it in the same way as uh, Jana and Simon, that it's very important to sequester the carbon uh, in the soil and the longer you practice the no-till or the low-till and the better results you, you will have because the system mm -hmm. needs to adapt to the change of agricultural practice over time. Yeah, so there's a lag, lag time involved as well. Uh, my colleague, uh, Geraldo, he interviewed Emilio Gonzalez, Secretary General of the European Con Conservation Agriculture Federation, and uh, basically said if glyphosate were to be banned, some farmers would use alternatives, but many of them would go back to tillage. You agree with that, Jana? Mm, yes, it, it's a little bit, yeah, I, I think it's um, it's a problem that uh, for the real no-till system, so that at the moment we don't have really alternatives in the no-till system uh, to replace the glyphosate. So when you don't have any tillage operation uh, in the system, so you need uh, a way to uh, use herbicide to have handle the uh, weeds and also the um, cover crops maybe in um, co uh, conservation tillage system so you can handle it maybe also without glyphosate and uh, but in real no-till systems it would be very difficult uh, and yeah, but I hope that um, yeah we we find solutions and um, also to to can also use uh, glyphosate for mulch and no tillage system um, in the future. Thank you, uh, Gottlieb Bash uh, sent an interesting comment there. Gottlieb, before I, I, I touch that, can you tell us where you're from, please, as well, and just add. A little bit more detail on your comment about uh, carbon tons per year. Uh, thank you. We're coming fairly close to to our time, and I want to give our um, our panelists an opportunity to to round up as well. So, to our audience, if you want to send a question, uh, please send it now. Uh, Simon, you in terms of what needs to be done uh, and and research and on uh, soil biodiversity, what's missing from the picture? What still needs to be added into this conversation? 
Well, one of the complicated things is, uh, despite the potential for conservation agriculture to have multiple gains in terms of uh, reduced uh, establishment costs, environmental benefits, reduced soil erosion, it's how we get through this transition in the first place. So generally to move towards conservation agriculture means having new equipment such as seed drills, which aren't cheap, and also many farmers uh, suffer yield penalties for the first two three years uh, of going through the transition. So what's missing is how we can encourage farmers to start farming in a more environmentally friendly way through conservation agriculture and support them to make this change. Okay, so yeah, now clearly there's there's a, a role, like many elements of, of the Green Deal, that uh, we have to support the transition phase. This is not going to happen overnight. Um, is is the market ready for that? Is the European Union assisting that? Is the policy uh, pointing that direction? Yes. Uh, so how Simon said that we need more uh, steps uh, or more um, support for the farmers to to change the tillage system and to get more in this transit period, uh, more help, more knowledge, more exchange and also between maybe also the green deal uh, more support uh, from the european union okay thank you Frigini, anything to add on that um no not really <laughs> that's fine uh good leave <laughs> i did respond here is the bot uh but i'm not certain exactly the dynamics we're talking about in terms of carbon per year you want to put a link in there, Gottlieb, maybe the team can uh, forward that and, and others can see it as well. Some background on the impact of uh, the conventional tillage cultivation compared with uh, glyphosate use as well. Um, okay, so let's uh, try to tie all this together a little bit as well. So from my perspective, what I see is there's a body of evidence which points in the direction of uh, it, uh, on the balance of probabilities, there is no harm being done by glyphosate. And the research uh, will continue, and uh, every 10 years this will be evaluated if uh, the renewal is granted. And that the body of evidence that this uh, comes from is uh, widespread. Uh, it's uh, evaluated across many countries, many international organizations, um, and yet there's still a lot of political pushback on this as well. Perhaps uh, the facts are not uh, fully understood as yet and uh, the idea that it's we're sitting at the best possible position uh, in terms of available technology uh Virginie, do you see new technologies is there anything on the horizon of the development research pipeline where you would say well actually maybe glyphosate could be replaced and here's the solution yes so um in terms of uh, chemicals, I would say glyphosate is very unique. It is the only broad spectrum herbicide that we have at the moment that is really efficient and has uh, a good environmental profile, if, if, if I would uh, say so. So I was mentioning before that I have been working some, some years uh, in developing a new herbicides. And th there are some solutions, but at the moment, none of the new solutions we have in our pipeline are able to replace glyphosate very efficiently. Um, so th this is for the for the chemical part, if you like. If we talk about other alternatives to glyphosate, there are not only the chemicals, there are also all the mechanical uh, methods. Uh, here we talked a lot uh, about tillage. In the future, we can think about other uh, methods, uh, like uh, maybe more targeted uh, methods with drones, with robots. There are lots of things that are in development for the future. But I would say this is not the near future. So before those technologies of the future will be ready, we will have a, a lag phase. On, uh, on, on which uh, I think glyphosate will remain the, the tool of choice for, for helping us in sustainable agriculture. Okay, so as far as we can see, this is the, these are the, the alternatives that uh, we have set before us. 
All right, and no more questions from the audience. Uh, they've been super good today. Uh, and directions, so thank you for that. And I'm going to ask our panel just for their concluding remarks as well. Yana, let's uh, kick off with you. Okay. So um, what we discussed today is that um, how can we create uh, a sustainable uh, producing and, and farming system? And uh, when we have the soil in our mind that we want to protect, we want to uh, save uh, carbon in the soil, and we have a lot of uh, opportunities um, to do that with conservation agriculture, for instance. And um, so for the next future, is it one farming system to solve all a lot of problems um, what we have um, for the future? Thank you. Simon. Yeah, I would come back to what I said at the start, really, that soil is really an under, undervalued resource. It's really one of the most precious resources we have on the planet. There's this thin veneer that only covers actually a small part of the world, uh, and we are literally all uh, vitally dependent on it. So we need to look after that, and we need to look after it carefully. Every time there's an erosion event, we lose a little bit of that soil that we depend on. Every time there's contamination events, uh, every time that there's compaction, uh, we, we lose some of the, the value of this soil. And sustainable agriculture, and we need to move rapidly in that direction to prevent our soils de degrading further. And as said before, glyphosate represents a vital tool in the box to allow us to achieve that. Thank you. Brigini. Yes. From my side, I would like to re-emphasize that um, so it's important to talk about the safety of pesticides in general and of, in, of glyphosate in particular because the, for this herbicide, we are selling a lot of volumes. This is really widely used. So it's very fair that there is questions in the public and that we have a debate on this. And in order to be transparent in this debate, as I said, you can find all the studies and the relevant documents from the evaluation on uh, the GRG website and the transparency websites of the different companies of, uh, of the GRG. Now the evaluation is ongoing in Europe and we are confident that the European authorities will come up with science-based uh, assessment and uh, we are ready to help them by providing any information they, they would like us uh, to provide. And uh, with the vast uh, scientific information we have and also with the fact that glyphosate has been used for more than 14 years without uh, environmental impact or uh, big incidents we are confident that this is a safe and efficient uh, herbicide and i also think it really has a place of choice uh, in the toolbox of the farmer to enable uh, sustainable agriculture and the good uh, practice for preserving the soil uh, and the water. So I think it is a very important tool for, for the agriculture. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Jana, to uh, Simon and to Virginie for an excellent conversation uh, today as well. Thanks to our audience. Um, I hope we've been fair in putting across uh, your views and uh, the challenging remarks that, that, that you've made. Um, I think they were, they were uh, extremely well uh, directed. And uh, also to Sarah Singler, who uh, sent in uh, the video earlier as an uh, explainer. Um, we appreciate the time uh, that you took to do that. Uh, Sarah also was extremely useful for us. And to our own team at uh, Your Active, uh, Zoran, uh, Malta, Anna, and the social media team. Uh, our thanks also to Glyphosate Renewal Group uh, for supporting uh, the discussion uh, today as well. And that leaves me just to say uh, a good day to you. And I'm Brian McGuire. Mm -hmm.